only identify by telephone number. Would you be willing to uh, identify yourself either in the chat or, or by voice? It's the number 1669492243. Good. I see I also need to kill my Skype, otherwise. If I share my screen, you get bothered by all my messages. Uh, welcome again. Uh, I'll start the presentation. I'll share the screen. Uh, what we we have uh, here today is uh, a focus on IoT labeling, as you've seen in the invitation. And uh, IoT labeling is uh, an important part if we want this project to help make consumers uh, help consumers making smarter choices when they buy iot tools and services so in order to be uh, helpful they need to be meaningful and relevant uh, they need to be easily understood uh, but not only by people in this time uh, of search engines etc also by machines and they need to be backed in some way just a picture doesn't say much what does it stand for? So to explore these issues and, and what comes uh, uh, to the table with this, uh, we have a couple of speakers for you to, to help uh, introduce the topic. We want to use the first half hour for that. Uh, first, we will have Jonathan Cave, who's a professor at Warwick University, an economist and a game theorist. And he's been involved in what's called uh, the eco labeling uh, directive uh, in Europe. And from that, uh, quite some uh, insight in what it takes to create useful labels and also how you can uh, make that part of uh, enforcement and, and make sure things happen. Uh, after that, we get uh, Jacques Cruz Brandau. Uh, uh, from Germany, he is a uh, policy uh, director at uh, NXP, uh, also very much involved in, uh, in, in security initiatives. Uh, and uh, from that perspective, he can talk a little bit about, well, from a security pers uh, uh, perspective and a certification perspective, uh, comes to bear. Uh, and then uh, Faut Kahn, uh, some of you may have met him already. He's a square, squarely partner of this uh, project, and he has a security background, but also standardization. And uh, after the first two speakers, he'll also pull it towards the Canadian uh, situation. So first half hour is for our panelists to, to share. Second half hour is for panel discussion. I would say if you have questions uh, coming up for clarification, uh, please ask them, probably by preference, in the chat. Uh, and uh, the discussion we will keep for the, the next half hour. Uh, having said that, I'd love to give the floor to Jonathan and uh, uh, kick off the presentation. I, uh, we have one presentation, so please raise your hand when uh, you think it's time for me to put on the next one. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I'm Jonathan Cave. As Martin says, I'm a game theorist and so on. And just for clarity and for the avoidance of doubt, um, I'm a member of the Faculty of Economics at Work University. I'm a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute, and I'm the economist member of the British government's regulatory policy committee. Um, and with Martin, I've done a lot of work uh, for the European Commission, particularly on labeling types of issues. Now, I'm going to talk first from a um, from a sort of uh, economist's or a normative standpoint as to what policymakers might think that labels might do. Now, of course, there are many kinds of labels, and lots of them have purely commercial purposes. So they're designed to make products distinctive 
and to influence consumer decisions. Some part of that influence is to inform consumer decisions. That's particularly important in contexts like the IoT, where the reasons why people buy things and the purposes for which one person may use a device uh, are only part of the way in which the system as a whole responds to the presence of that device or the uh, need to service those particular uses. So these labels can actually affect both the choice of devices and the way the market responds and the way the world responds at different points in the product life cycle. In particular, before the purchase, labels help to inform consumer decisions in, uh, by enabling or making sure that the demand that consumers express and which firms seek to fill uh, captures their preferences and their levels of understanding. And these are not only concrete or functional preferences, but also include ethical principles, technical compatibility, and various other things. And the reason why I mention that is that a lot of these preferences will help to tell us how people are responding to things, uh, to the development of the Internet of Things. And so if people are appearing to use things that are not perfectly suited for the purposes they're using for them for, then innovation can be uh, incentivized or encouraged to meet those growing needs. Or if there are problems arising because of different generations of products that are on the internet, then other kinds of innovation can take place to resolve some of these issues. I'll just mention one example from the UK, which is smart electricity meters. The government uh, following EU directives decided to make sure that everyone had smart electricity meters. These meters were designed by the firms to use SIM cards to communicate with the electricity providers and provide real-time information that could be used for real-time pricing and so on. This was designed also to inform consumers so that they could switch to the most uh, effective and most rewarding subscriptions, which included things like green electricity. However, the meters as first devised had the property that when you switched provider, the meter often stopped working. It talked only to the originating provider system. As a result, it inhibited switching and sort of undercut the purposes for which it was done. That signal, the dissatisfaction of consumers, allowed people the fact that they would know that their meters were not doing what they meant to do, encouraged the government to begin creating a facility operated by the government as a whole that would talk to all of the meters and then talk to all of the suppliers to overcome that problem. Now, after the things are purchased, labels also help to make sure that the objects as used by consumers do the things that consumers expected them to do and designers intended them to do. So it can provide information as to how the devices can or should be used. It can document accountability trails for the manufacture and function of those devices. And it can also help to set the frame for other devices that might be purchased and hooked into those systems that might need to interoperate with them. And then finally, because these are electronic devices, by the end of the life of the device, um, the label can provide cues as to how these things should be disposed of in a, an environmentally sensible way. All right, okay, I didn't even have to wave, wave my hands. Now, um, from a practical perspective, the key point about labels is they have to balance very detailed, sometimes very technical information with the needs of consumers who have decisions to make. So they can provide direct information, but they can also provide pointers for specific users or consumers to much more detailed information. In the case of the energy labels that Martin mentioned, there is a label which tells you how much energy a device uses. There's also a pointer to a fiche that has much more detailed information on its function and the testing regimes by which those labels were uh, implemented. And it can also provide certification marks for things that couldn't possibly be explained. For example, cybersecurity or trust marks that appeal to a whole institutional context where you're using not the real information, but the reputation of the organization that provides that information. For purchase decisions, they have to complement the marketing. Could we go back, please? 
uh, but they have to complement the marketing um, information uh, in a way that is assured. They also have to be standardized because if we want to use demand, people have to choose the things that they like best, which means that they have to have a common basis of comparison. Whereas labels provided without any kind of framework will tend to frustrate comparisons rather than encourage them. They have to cover an important and defined set of attributes. Sometimes the law is used to do this. Sometimes industry self-regulation does it. They have to be easily available to people who might not necessarily look for them. And they have to provide up-to-date information. And they have to comply with a bunch of legal requirements on the label and the shape and appearance of the label, on what its contents are, how the contents are obtained, and on the description of the items. Okay, now we can move on. And, uh, Martin? Yes. Martin? Can we? Thank you. Uh, so, the. Flies, Jonathan. Uh, I'm just aware that uh, it's really little time that we have. Yeah, 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 I know. Um, so, on the online labeling thing, there was something which required labels on electricity using devices to say how much energy they use. The purpose of the labels was presumably to encourage people to express a demand for energy efficient devices and create an incentive for innovations that would reduce energy use. When they first came into use, those labels were responsible for 50% of the reduction in household energy use in the European Union. But as people began to do more and more online shopping, they made up their mind as to what to buy before they ever saw the label. And the information on the label took very much a second place to the feature description and to the price. Now, the law now requires them to be electronically available, which brings them closer to the point of decision, and it makes it much cheaper to provide this information and keep it up to date. And it makes it easier for users to get access to this information. But the key point was also that the information on the labels not be a PDF, but be machine readable, which allows third parties to come in and you can incorporate this information in search engines. You can check automatically to see whether the things are compatible with other devices and you can combine it with personal information, in that case, personalized energy tariffs, uh, so that it can express not only the, the information that consumers need to have or the characteristics that consumers want, but also new kinds of information that they might find relevant as they gather, uh, as they gather experience with these devices. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for this. Uh, clear framework uh, based on experience with the eco-label and also making aware it's not just a picture, it's also what's behind it and where you present it. Uh, so with that, uh, Jacques, without further ado, uh, please move on. There was one question from uh, Hussein about the role of government. I take that to the to the uh, discussion afterwards. Okay, please, Jacques. I need to um, enable. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So perfect. Thank you very much. Um, do I have control or do you switch the slides? I think I did. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So um, thank you for, for offering us the chance to, or me the chance to present what has been discussed in Europe um, on two organizations, um, basically on the organization of uh, EXO, it's called EXO, the European Cybersecurity Organization, and IoT, the Alliance of IoT Innovation. Both organizations, um, let's say, come from a different angle. Um, in the end, both organizations um, think about the label in terms of visualization of whatever is implemented and has been, let's say, um, evaluated by self-assessment, third-party evaluation, etc. Um, starting with the European Cybersecurity Organization, which is an organization of, uh, let's say, um, currently about 230 companies in Europe um, working on, on cybersecurity, also on verticals um, like Industry 4.0, mobility, banking, and so on. 
there is a working group um, one which is really looking into um, giving thank you you can switch already um, giving a proposal to the commission what um, on let's say on uh, what has been um, asked for. So the Commission came up uh, in last September with the European Cybersecurity Act, including the governance on um, the uh, EMISA on one hand, uh, and on the other hand, the European Cybersecurity Certification Framework. And there are several articles describing um, the need for security objectives, for different assurance levels, like for example here the basic uh, level, the substantial level on the, and the high level. And it's still in, in discussion, but um, uh, I think uh, uh, very far already, um, because it will go into the trilogue between the European Commission, the Parliament and the, and the Council. Meaning um, there is uh, probably a uh, uh, one view of uh, all European organizations in this case um, in the very near future. This includes a certification scheme and I would like to show you um, a proposal which has been drafted by the European, uh, this EXO organization, the European Cybersecurity Organization. Um, exactly. So um, looking into what the industry expects and um, Many at the table, many stakeholders at the table um, are involved in certification already since years. Um, NXT as well, of course. Um, and we have uh, certain needs. So we as the stakeholders have certain needs. Means um, it should be flexible, it should be agile. Um, as we know, common criteria certification, for example, is a very, um, let's say, um, a long process and not so agile process and um, same with the with the evaluation of processes um, and just to mention ISO 27000 for example um, um, there is different views of course because you need to have the economic view you have the, the societal view and you need to have the the, the consumer view um, looking into privacy, for example. So looking at the label uh, means that um, you need to, to trust the devices, the services, the backend systems, and the organizations which evaluate those uh, product services and backend systems and communications. Um, so of course, also the detection of cheaters in the supply chain, for example, is a, is a very important topic. Um, as we are in a very uh, dynamic world, of course, we need to think about how do we um, um, work on patches and updates um, related to labels, because labels so far were very static. Think about the eco label. Um, if there is a change, nobody would detect it. And you mentioned it already before. Um, online uh, connectivity is, is um, possibly a... a a given thing because we are talking about the hyper-connected world. So all these services and, 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 and devices will be connected. So why not connect, um, let's say, combine this with a label and give it more flexibility in the end um, to visualize whatever has been implemented in terms of cyber security. Next, please. Just do the complete one. So um, we started basically of um, on, on on working on a on a SOTA on a, on a syllabus of all um, available certification schemes in place. And you see already here the horizontal ones, which are ISO twenty seven thousand, for example, or the, the different common criteria schemes um, as a as a generic scheme. But of course, um, there are many. Uh, schemes in place already on, on certain verticals. So, um, so to say there, there are certification schemes available in finance and energy, you mentioned the smart meter gateways already or communication hubs in the UK um, or uh, in, in, um, in healthcare, um, but they are all different, but all have something in common. So think about an authentication process. These authentication processes um, why, why shouldn't they be, from a, from a baseline perspective, very similar and um, follow the same rules when, when it comes to trust of those product services and backend systems? Next slide, please. So there was the idea of um, looking basically on, the, uh, on, on various aspects. One is the assessment type. 
So who is the, the accredited third party or self-assessment uh, in, in some cases um, of a certain, let's say, uh, evaluation of, of the assurance of the implemented assurance level? Um, we looked at the different assurance levels as the commission also did and was um, just uh, mentioning the basic substantial and high. Um, in this case, we came up to, a, to, to five assurance levels, but they can be combined. Um, looking at the entry and basic, and basic is even a little bit more than entry level, um, but can be treated in a, in a similar way um, or in a different way, as you can see here, for example, the self-assessment and the third-party accreditation, um, uh, the, the third-party evaluation in this case. Um, on the right side, you see the different um, schemes. Um, today, there is um, as, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, many schemes are, um, are in place, available, and we counted about 290 different certification schemes in place today already. Looking into public transport, that's for example the MyFair certification, looking into finance, there's the EMVCO certification, looking into government products like electronic passports or electronic uh, driving licenses, then you have the common criteria usually in place and being used in, in many of those uh, applications. Next slide, please. At the same time, we were um, um, realizing there are gaps. So how to handle those gaps? What are those gaps? Um, and you see on the right side here, the, the, the SOTA, um, the, the blue um, dots are in this case the uh, available certifications. The red ones are being seen as the gaps and probably there are also some schemes which are not applicable for the IoT world in, 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 in the end. So the, the core T, the challenges on the, by, yeah, described by the industry, really we're looking into what is wrong with this um, or what is missing, what are the gaps and what do we need to change in terms to be more agile, more um, effective, faster, um, faster for a faster go-to-market, for a cheaper process in the end. And, and this is um, very important because we are living in a very dynamic world and things are changing and, uh, and the companies are challenged by those changes. So they need to, um, they need to uh, think about whether it's um, uh, appropriate to follow a certain, to, to let's say, evaluate a certain process or put a certain process in place, um, which everybody follows then in the company, um, or if a product certification is necessary for, for, for uh, a certain product. And in the end, you need to look at the complete system because the system is as trusted or trustful as the, the component, the system, uh, the, the, the products and the services or the backend infrastructure of that complete system is. So, um, this is a very important point to um, this system view and how to how to secure or trust the complete system. Of course, you need to to look at the verticals and and the and the horizontals, and they need to talk to each other, right? So, um, and this is on the on the left on uh, of this, uh, this chart here. Um, there are experts group which need to discuss together and think about whether they can make use of what is already existing, for example, in, in finance or in energy or in transport. So this is um, um, a very important uh, step. Um, and it's a, it's a status, right? So it's, it's not a solution, but it's a, it's a way forward. And, um, and this is need to be discussed how we move forward. But this, this is a proposal of the, of the uh, European Cyber Security Organization. Next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry. To visualize this, um, of course, you need to look or to ask the experts group on the certain criteria, which is, for example, the protection profile of a, of a, of a, of a certain um, uh, use case. Um, and you need to, to, look, to ask the vendor whether he would be interested in, a, in, in a generating a certain security target and add something to the um, to the protection profile because he wants to differentiate himself and this should be able to visualize later in a label um, otherwise the label is always the same and and um, and uh, probably the implementation would be different if there is no third-party evaluation and the end consumer 
um, or the other way around, the end consumer should be able to, um, to uh, understand what security uh, has been implemented and on, on which assurance level the device, service, or backend infrastructure is with, uh, with what he's working with. Um, and the, uh, looking at the, at the bottom, um, you need to uh, discuss, of course, whether you need a, a, an accredited third party, uh, which evaluates your implemented uh, cybersecurity solution, let's say it this way, um, or whether you do it uh, within a self-assessment and whatever this means, who's responsible for, and, and you also need to ask whether sometimes a business overrules whatever is um, necessary when it comes to uh, certification or, or, or self-assessment. So um, taking this into account, it's, it's also important um, to know what, when, when it uh, should be visualized or will be visualized within a label, however this looks like. So An excellent presentation, but uh, time flies as well. Yes, okay, next slide please. So looking to IoT, the IoT, the Alliance of IoT Innovation is about 500 companies in Europe um, looking into um, all kinds of IoT use cases. And there is a, a working group on standardization, one sub working group on security and another one on privacy. And here we are discussing, um, probably the next slide, um, how we, um, how we uh, let's say, treat the hyper-connected world. And there have been several uh, workshops initiated by the European Commission, DG Connect in this case, um, and supported by, uh, by the IoT Alliance of uh, IoT Innovation. And um, those workshops were primarily working on or looking into the practical privacy in IoT. We looked into the IoT hardware and the components, uh, onto the interfaces and the communication, as well as the applications. And another workshop looked into uh, the verticals, so meaning uh, looking into variables, into autonomous vehicles or connected vehicles, uh, into industrial IoT and into smart cities, and the, to find out whether there is a horizontal, a baseline, which is applicable for all those different verticals. And there was a solution on that because um, on the next slide, um, and you will find it in, via the link in the report. Please uh, you make use of this um, of this link and uh, have a have a look at the at the reports because they um, give a very good view on what are the baseline principles or the the, the, the key principles everybody should follow. Um, when it comes to service, uh, to products, to IoT products, to services, to communication, or the backend system, and and even further, the report um, um, gives some expression on um, maybe some guideline in the end, um, whatever is uh, necessary, whatever principle one need or should follow when it comes to those layers and dimensions. Um, and if you look at the layers and dimensions, you see here the service, the application, software, the hardware, the network, the infrastructure, and also the human factor, the, the privacy um, view, uh, including the data, and of course the authentication. And um, I think that's... Thank you very much. ...a view on those two activities here in Europe. And um, please um, uh, get back to me and, uh, and to give more information if, if it's... Okay, we, we'll move on now to, to FAUT, but uh, you will see that uh, Jonathan also already engaged in discussion in the chat. Uh -huh. Feel free to, to do that as well, in particular for clarification. And we'll use the last part of the time to, to dive into some of the questions that come up in the chat and that mm -hmm. beforehand as well. So thank you, Jacques, very clear. You're welcome. Um, now I'm trying to get to the next slide. Fout, it's your turn. Great, thank you. Uh, if you just want to move to the slide, so just, I know we're running a bit late, so for the sake of time, I'm really going to skim over a lot of things. Um, if you want to have a discussion about these in depth, I'll, you can definitely follow up with me because uh, I think it's important to have that discussion and we can, I know this is um, the multi-stakeholder process is going to have a lot more meetings, so it's all good. I uh, just want to begin with just to make everyone aware that the, what the current landscape is about. So primarily is there's these grouping of standards, right? So 
there's this grouping that's called management standards. Um, I think a lot of you on the call probably are aware of them. You see a lot of companies that are 9001 uh, quality assured. There's also 14001 for manufacturing and also the 27000 specifically for uh, security management systems. Okay, the, the, the important part to keep about management systems are that there's this overlying concept. So it is basically um, three things. So uh, do what you say, um, you know, uh, do what you say, say what you do, and prove that you did it. And that's basically the cover all for all these systems. And whether that's in quality assurance, whether that's in cybersecurity, or whether that's in manufacturing, those are the real guiding principles for this management, management standard. Electrical and safety standards, again, you'll probably see these again if you buy like a lot of products in uh, Canada, US, Europe. You might also, if you see the labels on these products or sticker on the back of these products, um, uh, whether it's consumer products, industrial products, you'll typically see one of these major companies that have uh, these stickers that certify that it's gone through some kind of testing and evaluation. Specifically around cyber, uh, there's uh, stuff from ISA 99 and common criteria Jacques kind of touched on those a little bit. Next slide, please. So the big thing is just to understand when you're reading a label, what does it actually mean? So one thing you have to understand about labeling is some of them are global in context and some of them are local in context. So for example, um, IEC and ISO standards are typically global in context. So if you see um, a reference to one of those, it, it means that. Um, for example, uh, Underwriters Laboratories has a 2900 series, which is for cyber, and typically it only has jurisdiction currently in the United States. So it would be good if your product is operating in the United States, it would basically contest and certify to that. But if you're in uh, Europe, Asia, um, Canada even, and this symbol doesn't necessarily have a lot of potential meaning because it's not really, um, it, it doesn't uh, mean it's tested something that's adopted or accepted in Canada right now, okay? Um, if you look at say something like the IEC 62443, that is typically accepted by most of the countries that are adopting ISO IEC standards. So if you get that or common criteria, same thing, that's why it's got the global recognition. So understand what you're getting, what it means. Uh, the other thing too is, um, if you look at, say, something like common criteria, there's multiple different levels. So what did those levels mean? What, is, what was it tested to? And what was, like, for example, the configuration of that tested device? Because you can test it in a specific configuration, but if you deploy it in a different configuration, it might not actually meet that requirement. So uh, one of the big things is, is when you purchase a standard, Try to understand what those implications are um, for your implementation. Next slide, please. So, big thing is around requirements. So, we really have to get a lot more precise in, you know, advising the consumer and the buyer. Um, and the consumer, in this sense, is uh, organization, government, or, or whoever. Um, you know, what does that actually mean? They really need to be clear on what was tested, how it was tested, um, but it also needs to look at things like maturity potentially. And I'll get to that in just a sec. Um, and also, what does this mean from a regulatory perspective? Because um, certain uh, countries, I know there's discussions about looking at these labels to determine if something is safe, um, if, if it's safe for use in certain uh, deployments. Uh, especially things like oil and gas, critical infrastructure. Okay, next slide, please. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, you can just go to the next one. So the next grouping of slides, uh, what I'm going to do at a very high level, um, the Canadian Standards uh, Group has created what they call the Cyber um, Verification Program. And so what I'm going to do is, really quickly talk about how they're trying to fix potentially some of the issues that we see. So this first slide shows what some of the challenges are. Jacques had talked about some of these. So if you kind of look at them, different standards, different insurance um, models look at different aspects. Now, how CSA is kind of approaching this is a bit different is, is it's looking more from a maturity perspective, where we basically consider all of the above in this slide. And so what they attempt to do is 
look at those attributes and then quantify them. Next slide, please. So here's the, the long and short of just basically when a vendor goes through the program, what does that look like? Um, it typically starts off where a vendor wants to look at the program. They go through a questionnaire, which is almost, think of that as a self-assessment. Uh, once that is basically completed, then that goes through grading process. And then what happens is, is there's an actual on-site audit that basically reviews at the claims that are made within that questionnaire. From that, basically, the, the base maturity rating is developed, so from zero to three. Um, so basically, where you want to see companies is at least at a one, approaching a two. And so that is basically the guideline that CSA is looking for to get product companies at. Um, from that, the findings report is created. If the company is at a high enough level, then basically what happens is, is that they go into the product testing phase. So there's the pen testing, there's the, um, can be things like source code analysis, all kinds of different cybersecurity testing and evaluation that are done in a laboratory setting, uh, fully repeatable uh, kind of testing and metrics that are completed. And at that point, there's an actual uh, attestation letter that can be assigned to the vendor company. Next slide, please. So um, some of the, the key elements that I just want to make you aware is uh, there is a process that was called BSIM that's been around for well over 10 years. That was basically the, the basis for how the questionnaire was created and the benchmark. Now that was then since um, grown um, to add several more domains and a lot more different focus areas. So what we do is we actually, when we started to look at how this was being created, was we actually expanded it to 18 practice areas. And then on top of that, uh, during the entire process, it's all about educating the vendor, right? So we're always trying to create a higher level of maturity, uh, not only for the organization, but for the, um, for the products that are being produced as well. Next slide, please. Should be the mapping. Uh, yeah, there we are. So this kind of gives you a sense to all the different practice areas. So within the different organizations, uh, for all of these 18 practice areas within the CVP, there's different levels. So there's uh, a level one, level two, and level three of questioning for each one of these areas. So you can see both the, the organization and the product that is being created are being evaluated. So from that, once they get through that entire process and that label is put onto that product or the attestation letter is basically um, issued, it gives that buyer purchaser a higher level of assurance that that product and organization is both running off uh, securely and also creating a secure product as well. Next slide, please. And this is kind of where the whole program is, just for uh, your knowledge. So the programs have been created. Um, there's several vendors in the in the process. Uh, we're piloting, uh, or um, uh, CSA is piloting the program right now. And basically where we want to get is industry acceptance. And from that, um, it's going to be published as a Canadian standard. And so at that point, the attestation letter can be created once it's published, and then we can get that labeling on products. And so CSA um, right now is looking to get that towards the latter part of this year. And then once that happens is we're trying to take that element and bring it into, um, uh, say, SC27, uh, SC41, at the ISO and IC level to actually make that an international kind of standard so it'll have global recognition. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very clear. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen because uh, it's a pain now. I can see more of you online as well. Uh, there's been an extensive chat in the sideline. Uh, I think Jonathan is on top of that. Can you shortly update us on what happened there? because I couldn't read it at the same time. And then we'll go into questions, so. Okay, well, there's, there's been a discussion, oops, yes. Uh, there's been a discussion of a bunch of issues that have come up uh, while the presentations were going on, including things like what the role of government might be, um, how you handle certification of devices that are manufactured outside the country, um, whether the labels that you develop for devices coming within a particular regulatory zone, the US, 
and uh, Canada in that particular case, or the EU and the US, whether you might need to have different certification procedures or labeling procedures for things developed for export. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? Um, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that pretty much brings us up to the point where we can start discussing it. Okay. Uh, if I've explained anything, just let me know. No, thank, thanks very much. Uh, uh, good questions. Um, indeed, uh, the, the, the dominant one at the end seemed to be, so uh, what to do with labels from outside the, the, the jurisdiction. Uh, let's start first with, uh, we talked about labeling. And uh, we talked about uh, clearly uh, different uh, levels of labels. We talked about labels that uh, inform people about qualities. And we have labels that inform people about assurance, like something has been tested for certain things, etc. Uh, very quick uh, view on that from, from, from you guys and other people can come in. Please raise your hand or. Uh, uh, Type in the chat. May, can I start with, uh, with you, Jacques? Well, uh, the labeling, uh, the inf to inform people about qualities or to assure them of certain levels. Yes. Um, so, <clears throat> in in this case, the the discussion was really on on how to generate trust. Um, generating trust means um, in, in the cybersecurity world, usually it's about ask a third party, um, probably make use of ethical hacking, um, because uh, where are we living? We are living in a connected world, um, being challenged by those who are trying to break those systems, um, and they make use of state of the art. So we should also make use of the state of the art and, and not um, um, always think only about baseline. So baseline is is probably uh, looking also only into the into hit into the uh, backwards um, because it's about yes we know what has been um, what has been um, attacked and how it has been attacked. But um, um, from a semiconductor perspective, we of course look into embedded systems, embedded security um, on different levels of assurances in the end. Um, and um, how and, and, and need to predict, <laughs> trying to predict the future. What are the possible future attacks we need to tackle in our product um, to, let's say, um, are at least future proof for for the next years. Um, and I know about the discussion on on yes, we have industry 4.0 products. Uh, let's say industry products for the next 20 or 30 years. Um, also here, we probably need to, to challenge ourselves and, and make, um, may um, uh, divide the, the device, the machines from the communication and from the, from the system uh, connectivity. Um, and um, I know about the discussions on, on, on uh, smart meter gateways and um, behind the doors, it was a replacement cycle of seven years only and not 20 years. And this is, now we're coming into into more into the reality and into um, how do we deal with um, with dynamics of the markets, dynamics of the products, and, and because we are continuously evolving those systems and looking into the automotive world, um, we have uh, similar issues. We have uh, ten. Ten years product life cycles at the moment, uh, or probably well, maybe seven years product life cycles, but the the, the cars we are in the streets for the next 10 years and, and longer. Um, on the other hand, we are um, heading towards automated and more, even more automated, uh, autom I'm not saying autonomous, right? <laughs> I'm talking about autonomy. <laughs> um, would love to talk about autonomy, but um, um, this is probably an, an evolution where we need to look at. And on the other hand, we see systems with 500 uh, millions of, or 500,000 lines of, of code um, how to, um, uh, with uh, an, an update every day. Um, so I, I, I think there are car manufacturers in the, in the streets who update uh, 365 times a year. So meaning one, one update a day. How to 
how to evaluate those process, those, those products or processes or software solutions applications. Um, uh, and of course, we need to look then into the processes of the development itself, and we need to follow certain rules. And, and I think that's the only way to generate trust and and um, ask third parties, um, which uh, are probably able to to um, make use of what they see in other segments and other in other. Uh, regions also um, and uh, to, to, to be able to set up uh, this hyper-connected world and industry for zero is a nice example because you need to look into the into the supply chain and if you really look into a supply chain of a, of a certain system of a product there is a design designer in, in the US or in Europe there's a production in, in China there is the customer uh, all over the world <laughs> in Brazil um, and, and those systems talk to each other and should be secure right otherwise you, you cannot trust the, the, the services anymore. I think, I think you're very clear and uh, uh, <laughs> let, let's try to keep the answers concise because I love yeah. your, your, your thing but I also would like to hear from uh, uh, from Fout, uh, who is more experienced with the electrical industry, as I understand. But the mm -hmm. perspective, uh, how do you see that? Yeah, so I, I think from my perspective, um, I mean, IoT, I think, is a great opportunity for cybersecurity. Uh, I mean, I've been a cybersecurity practitioner for 23 years. I've seen just about it all, uh, lived through just every kind of attack imaginable. Um, so when I look at just what happened is, is that, it really is the opportunity to wake up development and engineering organizations that you have to have a secure development life cycle, like you have to. Um, and to come back to what Jacques was saying, I mean, a lot of these things can be mitigated by just doing the basics. I want to say the basics is threat model your product when you design it, right? It's, it starts there. Once you understand what your threat model is, whether you're producing code loads every day, whether you're producing uh, products from third-party providers that have third-party libraries and third-party chipsets, by doing that threat modeling at the beginning, you actually understand what the risk is to your product in field. And also you're doing things like your threat risk assessment at the beginning. And I'm talking technical. I'm not talking some of the fluff stuff that we see floating around out there. I'm talking deep core, pull the, pull the covers back, get into the bits and bytes of what actually is happening within those products. Then you do uh, privacy impact assessment. Like those three things should be standard at the beginning of every single project and they should drive the features that go into it. I'm not saying that every vendor needs to fix them, release one, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the vendor needs to understand what the risk is, how it's going to be attacked, and then also deal with those things in multiple revisions. So over the course of the lifetime, they actually understand that that product has a lifestyle or a life uh, span of like 10 years or 20 years. What does that mean to infield upgrades and the data it's collecting, producing, storing, and finally, how will it be destroyed? Because there could be remnant data that's left on that de device if it's not properly dis destroyed, could lead to um, a national uh, security incident or could lead to personal data being leaked, countless other things. Understand what those elements are at the beginning. And there's all kinds of standards that have been created. So if you look, for example, 27034 on application security, and don't get caught up in the word application because it can be used for IoT, but it teaches the organization how to consider all of those things from creation or concept all the way to basically the company has gone belly up how does that data have to be, uh, and those devices have to be destroyed? So certification by design, uh, starting already at design and for the process. Uh, yep. I hear very well, we also hear from both of you very well, the aspect of uh, the long-term impact of things. Uh, and, and as uh, indicated, we can learn from other industries, although at some point you may consider the car industry to be an IoT industry as well. Anyway, uh, John. Really? Uh, back to also the, the content of the label. Uh, so is, is it about uh, uh, assuring or informing or how, how should we see that? If we keep in the back of our mind that it's about better informing consumer choices. 
Well, a lot of these choices are not just the initial purchase choice. So a couple of small remarks. The first is threat models and attack models go naturally with the cybersecurity environment, but the risks in the IoT and the uncertainty in the IoT go far beyond the attacker defender frame. And so it's important to think about the collective or emergent problems like cascade behavior and so on that may also happen when these things interact. And so when we think about things like auditing algorithms and controlling the nature of algorithms, particularly ones that do deep machine learning and can't be, you know, you can audit the source code all you want, it won't tell you anything useful. Uh, then you do have to have this thought that, that I would suggest, you need to have it in a different way, um, also in a more systemic way and keep an eye on that information. The second thing is there's a liability issue. That if I label something and certify it and say that it's okay for certain uses, then I'm taking on to myself the financial and in some cases the moral liability for when that thing goes wrong. So if people ignore the information that I provide, then that's a different thing. Um, so here, when we think about trust, the trust thing cuts both ways. That if I encourage you to trust me, I'm opening myself up to certain risks. And you can see this in particular if you look at how the cyber insurance market works. Um, now, two other small things that bring us back to this issue of informing um, uh, versus certifying. The first is this cultural issue. In some cultures, like the CSERT culture, the aviation security culture, the participants are very, very open about sharing information relating to publicly acknowledged and accepted risks. So the risks that we can all see as bad, they will talk about, even if it damages the reputation of the firm or damage it because they have a, a common interest and the regulatory stance is, this is your problem, how can we help you deal with it? In other cultures, in other cases, in particular things like pharma, the stance is very, very different. And people keep to themselves information, even which may be relevant to their rivals, uh, if it's in their interest to do so. So part of this is a cultural change around this. Um, the other thing that I think is absolutely vital is that the label is important. You know, you can keep the labels here up to date. So we've heard a lot about how things change and how they change during the lifetime of products and how the function of the system changes when it's got products of different generations interacting inside the system. Now, if I only looked at the label when I bought the thing, even if it's a live label, right? And so one of the government stances is to require each device to have an identifier, a type identifier, not a unique identifier. So you get around the privacy stuff. A type identifier that links to an online database that has to be kept up to date and could document things like interactions. Now we get this to some extent with drugs. If you look up a drug, you will find out what its interactions are with other drugs because they know in that case they're all going to be part of the same system, namely you or I. So you could have that, but if you have even such a live label and you never look at it when you turn on your system or never consider any changes that might have happened after you bought the thing, it's not actually going to harness market forces, it's not going to inform civil society, it's not going to provide feedback to industry, so I'm not sure that labeling as opposed to push notifications of certain things um, will entirely help. And we all know the problems with push updates to certain things when the characteristics of those updates are either not understood or where understanding them is not proportional to the use that people make of those devices. And so if you require them to pay attention to all this detailed stuff, like GDPR notifications, right? We get all this information, and the only rational thing to do is to ignore it. But then everyone says, oh, well, the problem's solved, because we told people this stuff, and they clicked OK. And they opted in instead of opting out, and so everything's fine. Except these are human beings, and it's not fine. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I know we are approaching the top of the hour, and uh, but I would like to have one more question. So bear with me. If you really need to go on top of the hour, do so. Otherwise, we'll run over a little bit. Um, I have two questions on my list. One is, so how to deal with outside of the country? Uh, the fact that we are in a global society. 
I think there has been an extensive uh, conversation on that in the chat. Uh, so I've, uh, that one uh, I would leave to the chat for the moment. The other one was uh, what role for government, uh, which was the first question raised by uh, a participant, by Badran. Uh, so I'd like you to uh, uh, wrap up in particular with a focus on the role of the government and any uh, wise advice you would give this group in moving forward, in particular with, the, with respect to uh, labeling and certification. In this, I do recognize that Jonathan and Jacques may not be always around, uh, not living in Canada. Uh, Fout will be, uh, uh, but uh, still, uh, I think the interaction, the connection has been made. So, uh, may I start with uh, Jonathan first, and then we do it the other way around? Okay, I'll, I'll be I'll be fairly quick about this uh, and the role of government because I put some stuff already in chat to to a certain extent. I think government's role in this, in part, is to ensure policy coherence across the the different kinds of policies, which tend to get a bit stovepiped. And that can interfere with the ways in which labels function. But that to explain that is a, is a subject for another forum or another occasion. Second thing is the government can perform a co-regulatory function. Now, obviously, a lot of these things and the content of the labels and the form in which they're presented involve real stakeholders. They may be industry stakeholders, they may be user groups, what have you. But they may need a certain degree of backing or assurance from uh, the legal structure also as they affect trade between different countries. So I've had a look, for example, at the provisions of the CETA treaty, which is the one most relevant to this discussion. That's the Canada-EU free trade agreement. And there, there are a lot of standards and regulations which need to have mutual recognition. And indeed they have them, but they have an arrangement whereby the recipient country takes the responsibility of verifying compliance. So uh, the other things are two other small tools that may be useful. When you have regulations or rules, there's an instrument called the Dear CEO Letter that regulators, instead of legislators, can send to people with decisions to make. And I've just seen ones that Ofcom, for example, and the Financial Conduct Authority have sent to people involved in uh, automated trading and certain other forms of over-the-top service to help to align their behavior and their expectations. So it's not quite as strong as direct regulation, but it is the government serving as a platform to collect different stakeholder experiences and translate them into rules. And um, the same thing happens whenever you have rules or regulations to provide guidelines about how you apply them. Now the guidelines are not rules, they create an expectation but the idea is that you can choose not to follow the, if you follow the guideline, you're safe. If you choose not to follow the guideline, you're conducting an experiment. A lot of these labels will be natural experiments as things change. And an experiment is wasted if we don't pay attention to the results that come from it. It's useful if we do. And so by having guidelines and a clear process for departing from the guidelines, we can help the system to evolve in a more coherent fashion and not get these kind of network excess volatility, excess inertia problems. Okay, that's me. Thanks a lot, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Fout, may I get to you? And then the last word will be to Jacques after that. Okay, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of regulatory framework. Um, and I think that if you look at what the PETA does in Canada specifically, right, around data breach notification, I think it's a step in the right direction because a lot of these services and devices deal with consumer and business user information. So I think it's critical. My biggest concern would be that um, now that we have this framework in place is, will the government actually hang the first company? Strong statement, I know what I'm saying, but if they don't make that first example and show that they're willing to pursue this, it's all for naught because companies and executives will go, they're not going to do anything, boys. Let's do what we want. And that's been the mindset of a lot of Canadian executives, whether we want to accept it or not. Okay. So 
unless we start to make examples of companies who violate the rules, it doesn't mean anything. So I think there should be clear guidance to specific sectors to start, okay? Things that are critical energy and medical should have clear labeling and guidance and that should represent to both the medical practitioner and the um, patient that they understand what the usage of that product is. And it should be clearly defined that violations need to be reported to a central authority. I don't know who that is. I don't have all the answers. I'm not a policymaker, but there needs to be some mechanism in the case of uh, data breaches or compromises to being reported to someone. That could be OPC in Canada, I don't know. It could be ISET, I don't know. But that framework needs to be part of the entire, what's being considered as the IoT um, policy framework that would be created. That'd just be my, my take, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thought uh, Very clear, I, I fully agree. Uh, Jacques? So maybe, um, yeah, well, two, two aspects, uh, maybe. On, on the regulation, I think it's not about the regulation. It's about the question how we generate a level playing field. And um, companies who implement security in a good way and in, the, in, the, in a trusted way should not be, um, um, let's say, hurt because of doing this in, a, in, a, in the right way. So um, the, regula the regulation at least can support to generate this level playing field, even if they only say security by design, security by default, without going into details. Because the industry, all the stakeholders together, um, are then forced to sit together to come up with a harmonized solution. And of course, the companies are internationally uh, or are looking into the international solution, there, so they would not go only for a European solution or for a Chinese solution or for a US solution. They would go, they would ask, how can we bring the, those things together? And we need to take into account that um, there are not all standards in place. And we need to discuss um, to fill the gaps and what are the gaps and, and um, yeah. So looking into the, um, is it really necessary? Think about the automotive world. In the 70s, we, we didn't have a seat belt. And all these, um, 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 what do you call them, the, the, the airbags and, and all the security, the, the safety systems um, have been mandated. They are not implemented by the companies themselves. So it, it helps a society to, to, to evolve, um, to, to have some, some regulation which which uh, drives things forward and the hyperconnected world is there is no possibility of 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 of, um, of uh, re uh, redeveloping a device it, it, you need to wait for the second version right so for uh, a device is is then done and and nobody would, would would touch it anymore maybe maybe some patches of course but uh, but not from a from a by design perspective that's that's done then um, so another one is probably I would like to go to, to come up to the accountability. So um, we have a, um, a initiative which is called the Charter of Trust, and there were ten. There are ten principles in that, and this is an industry-driven initiative. And principle number one is taking the ownership, and this is something uh, I think is what, one of the most important things. If companies take the ownership of doing the risk assessment, of doing the the impact assessment and then follow their rules internally and set up the, the knowledge um, to implement those uh, uh, things properly, then I think we, of course, we would not need any regulation. Um, and, and maybe this is another approach and, and uh, I would like to refer to. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, we, we're running over the hour, so I'll uh, move towards uh, wrapping up uh, Please know that both the presentation and also the taping of the video uh, will be available online on the website of the initiative. Um, I think we'll safely invite Jonathan and Jacques to uh, join us as well in the Slack. Uh, Slack is the platform we use for conversations and progressing this. If you guys are, are, are now interested enough to, to do so, uh, and I think you are. Um, so the high density of information uh, will try to boil down in uh, a short report. 
Uh, and again, uh, feel free to, to look again at the tape or uh, particularly the sections you really like. So one of the things we didn't talk about next to what from outside of the country, and a lot of that is in the chat, uh, is for instance certification. Do we look at uh, certifying vendors or products or even the concatenation of those products in the service? Uh, and probably it's a combination of those and uh, it has different purposes. Uh, so that is something for later as well. Uh, Self-certification or a third party certification, uh, Jacques mentioned it already early on, uh, important uh, and it also needs to be scalable. I think that's one of the things we'll, we'll touch upon as well in the coming period. But altogether, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, speakers, Thank you very much for uh, preparing this so well together and, 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 and coming together on this. I think we have a big boost to uh, this subject, uh, which is key in the aim of the project uh, for security in Canada in the first year. It's to get a consumer to make better choices and in that way, uh, a better IoT environment. So all of best. And uh, wherever you are, uh, a good day, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, looking forward to see you again.